your patient suddenly went flaccid right in front of you, started complaining of numbness and tingling in their arm, or maybe their jaw drooped, would you know how to recognize and treat an ischemic stroke? Would you be able to explain to their family members and this patient what is going on? Would you know how to relay the proper information to the doctor? Well, I'm Danielle. I work as an acute care nurse practitioner, and today we're going to talk about ischemic stroke. Seven things. One, what ischemic stroke is, the definition. Two, the types of ischemic stroke. Three, risk factors. Four, signs and symptoms of ischemic stroke. Five, treatment. Six, diagnosis. Seven, nursing considerations. So let's get started. Ischemic stroke is basically when the blood vessels in your brain, one of them becomes blocked or clogged. And because of this blocked or clogged artery, then that tissue around the brain isn't getting enough oxygen and it's gonna die because it's not getting oxygen. The brain is very dependent on oxygen. So under ischemic stroke, there are essentially two types that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about embolic and thrombotic, okay? So embolic stroke, under ischemic stroke that we just talked about, embolic stroke is essentially saying that some type of embolus, debris, blood clot, something like that, travel from somewhere else in the body and through a clot to the head and a dislodged uh, had essentially made a clot in the blood vessel. So I'll give you an example. I had a patient that um, she came in with AFib and she had a lot of AFib but she wasn't on blood thinners because she was at high risk for falls and things like that. Well she started having stroke signs and sure enough after we got the imaging back she had essentially blood clots throughout her whole brain there just because her heart had splurted off from AFib spread it off little clots and they went to her brain. I also had a patient who essentially, he came in last week and he had a clotting disorder and he was complaining of like numbness. That was his only symptom. And come to find out he was essentially throwing clots from his body throughout his brain as well. So this can happen if like um, a patient develops a clot in the arm or a leg or something like that and parts of it spur off. So essentially, Embolic stroke is where a little clot, debris, some sort goes, travels from the body up to the brain and includes the brain that way, causing ischemia. So we've talked about essentially ischemic stroke. Essentially, that's a, something clogging, uh, a dislodgement of the brain or something cutting off blood supply to that area. And under ischemic stroke, we've talked about embolic stroke. Now, thrombotic stroke is the second type, and this is under ischemic stroke as well. It's like an umbrella. So, embolic is the first type. Thrombotic is the second type. Thrombotic stroke is essentially something that is cutting out blood supply within the brain. And this is usually seen in older people with atherosclerosis. Um, and some kind of um, essentially build up from high cholesterol, things like that inside their brain, as you guys can see in this picture here. So we've talked about what ischemic stroke is. We've talked about the types of ischemic stroke, thrombotic and embolic. Now, let's talk about risk factors. Risk factors, you have the modified ones and the unmodified ones, meaning the modifiable ones are things that you can do something about, and the unmodified ones are things that you really don't have any control over. So, risk factors for stroke. Let's talk about the ones we don't have control over. African Americans are at high risk, okay? They don't have control over that. We don't. I'm African American, too. Um, age, as you age, as people age, especially particularly over the age of 55, every decade essentially your risk of stroke goes up. That's something you can't help. Women, essentially, um, have more strokes than men, not because of so much they're women, but because they live longer and they have higher complications. 
So age, sex, gender, race, uh, familiar like traits. Uh, if if it runs in your family to have strokes, genetic traits, things like that. Those are things you can't control. But other things you can control, and this is what we need to focus on, and this is what we need to help our patients understand. And it's important. They're going to look at you as the healthcare provider. You're a nurse. You know what you're talking about. So when you talk to them about modifiable risk, it's important that you know what they are so you can help change, help your patient change the risk that they actually can. So diet is a huge one in this country most of the people that die of strokes and suffer from stroke have it because of the modifiable risk factor so diet eating high cholesterol food fried chicken french fries hamburgers things like that that's something you can change a sedentary lifestyle contributes to it obesity contributes to it uh, uncontrolled diabetes high blood pressure these are things that essentially are modifiable risk that you can talk to your patient about say hey you know maybe you should just go on a walk around the block a few times or however you want to bring that in to encourage them to start exercising and changing their diet for the better smoking and alcohol are another modifiable risk factors so we've talked about what ischemic stroke is the two types of ischemic stroke thrombotic and embolic We've also discussed the risk factors. Now, let's talk about signs and symptoms. Diplopia, seeing double of something. Nystagmus, the constant involuntary eye movement. Okay? Hemoparesis, essentially weakness on one side of the body. Weakness in a limb, you'll see a lot. Facial droop is another one. Dizziness is a sign. Sudden loss of consciousness or a change in mental status or other signs. Now just be careful because a lot of other things can mimic a stroke. And you need to be aware of this as a nurse so you won't look stupid when you call the doctor. Um, for instance, I was in Haiti volunteering in the emergency room and this patient came in and his two family members essentially were carrying this guy in. He was a young guy and they were carrying him in. And he was essentially, he could, he was too weak to walk, to talk. He was so, he was about to pass out. I, we checked his blood sugar and it was 22. 22, that is extremely low. So hypoglycemia in particularly can cause a risk of stroke. So if you see somebody with a change in mental status who isn't acting right, absolutely check their gl uh, blood glucose as well because that can mimic a stroke. Another thing that can mimic a stroke are drugs. Um, a lot of drugs can do it, uh, sedatives can do it, antipsychotics, a lot of just pills that patients are on can mimic strokes. And sometimes the drugs that they do can give them a stroke. I had a lady, she was 53 years old and she came in, her blood pressure was like 220 over 152, crazy high. And she essentially had essentially right arm weakness, right leg weakness, she couldn't move that whole side. And I'm asking, hey, when did this start? And do, are, do, are you on any drugs? What's going on? And no, you know, we weren't doing anything and it just happened all of a sudden and I don't do drugs and things like that. Well, when we checked her urine um, drug screen, it came back positive for cocaine. And cocaine can essentially shoot your pressure up so high that it can cause you to have a stroke like that. So it's important to also, also try to get to the bottom of what's going on as well. So those are the signs, the common signs and symptoms of a stroke. Um, that we talked to about the diplopia, this dysarthria, difficulty with speech, aphasia, um, double vision, hemoparesis, things like that, uh, dizziness, vertigo, nystagmus is another one. So we talked about ischemia, what ischemic strokes are, the different types of ischemic strokes, thrombotic and metabolic, the risk factors for ischemic stroke, the common signs and symptoms of ischemic stroke, and we also discussed a little bit about other things that can mimic an ischemic stroke. So now, let's go into 
Diagnosis, how do you actually diagnose an ischemic stroke? Diagnosis is contingent upon a CT scan or an MRI, a CAT scan essentially, or an MRI. A CAT scan can be done quick, fast, it's usually supposed to be done within 25 minutes, okay, of the patient arriving to the ED. A CAT scan is supposed to be done. And what this will show us is if the patient actually has a bleed because that's what we're looking for. If you're wanting to give a patient TPA, which is the treatment, then you need to make, which will essentially bust that clot, then you need to make sure the patient doesn't have a bleed. And how we do this is through a CAT scan. And it can also be done through an MRI, but you may not see that at the hospital that you're working at because MRIs essentially can take a lot longer. And in some patients who are like claustrophobic, they won't tolerate an MRI because it's loud, it's noisy, they're in this little cubby hole and it freaks them out. Um, other things is people with pacemakers can't go to the MRI. So you'll see CT scan a lot more, but MRI or CT scan essentially help diagnose acute ischemic stroke, okay? So that's what we're looking for um, to make sure that this pa or this patients do don't have bleeds. We've talked about what ischemic stroke is, the different types of ischemic stroke, thrombotic and embolic, the risk factors for this, signs and symptoms, and how to diagnose ischemic strokes. Now, how do you treat a patient with an ischemic stroke? Tissue plasminogen activator, TPA. Yes, because it'll go in and it'll help bust open that clot. It'll that's the, that's the point, we want it to dissolve, we want it to break up that clot, we want it gone. So this patient can perfuse their brain and they can get better and we can get it fast. So the goal for the treatment essentially is to give this drug as soon as possible, okay? We, if we don't know how long the patient was down, if they were found by the family member at some unknown time, then we really can't give this drug because we don't know, this drug has a time limit, three and a half to four hours out, max is the time limit so if we don't know how long they had these mental status or these stroke like symptoms then we can't give this drug so three and a half to four hours out is the time frame that we essentially cut that off and that is in select patients and um, these so patients who essentially can't get this drug or patients who have had head bleeds before or let's say you get a CT of your patient and they have a head bleed well I mean why would we make their head bleed worse by giving them TPA if they already have a head bleed? We're not going to give it to them, right? So no TPA in patients with head bleed. If they have any kind of internal bleeding, we want to veer away from it. If they've been on um, anticoagulation like uh, warfarin and their INR is high, we want to stay away from it as well. Um, so that's the treatment. That's the mainstay treatment. Other nursing things that you could do and make sure the patient has, these patients are really gonna be uh, likely dehydrated. So IV fluids is a good thing to start managing their blood, uh, blood sugar level. All right, you don't want it to be too high or too low because if it's too low, it can essentially exacerbate the brain and cause tissue damage as well as if it's too high. I remember when I first started, I didn't know anything about uh, strokes or anything. And I hung a patient, I put them on, I put her sugar was borderline. Um, it was kind of, it was normal. I'll, I'll say it was normal. But I put her on dextrose and normal saline and when I did that, her blood sugar um, was fine, but it kind of started to go up a little bit, but I just figured because she wasn't eating, she would need it. But the neurologist came by, he was really upset that I did that because it can cause damage to the brain. So you don't want the blood sugar to be too high or too low in these patients. Other things that you want to check for is cardiac rhythm. All right, so you want to have them on a cardiac monitor because maybe they have a little AFib going on or something with their heart that they're shooting off clots to their brain. I had a guy who, uh, he was young, like 20 something, and he came in, he was an IV drug abuser, and he was complaining of dizziness and blurred vision and double vision. So we did a um, we did an MRI and it did show clots in the brain. So essentially, we when we looked at his heart, uh, 
he had vegetation on his bowels from using IV drugs. IV drugs, that bacteria and vegetation started to sit on his bowels and when it did that, it started to splur off to his brain and that's how he got embolus to his brain. Okay, so monitoring the heart, putting them on an EKG, getting an EKG, putting them on a cardiac monitor is a good thing. Checking their glu blood glucose is another thing. Looking at their liver enzymes and their INR, essentially uh, their INR because they could be clotting off. INRs can be super high in patients who have no signs of bleeding. I, I, I get asked all the time, these patients will look normal and somebody attending will, go, will come up to me and say, hey, can you put a central line in my patient? When I check the INR, the INR will be like 13, which is crazy high. Normal is like 0.8 to 1.2. So I need to know when I'm sticking this patient, they're going to bleed out. So we need to know this stuff because if your patient is going to receive TPA, then we don't want to give it to a patient with the INR of 13, right? Because they're going to bleed out, essentially probably bleed to death if you give them um, TPA on top of that. So checking their coax, checking their liver function, put them on a monitor, get them good IV fluids, monitoring their glu glucose and getting them TPA if they're a candidate as soon as possible are all good treatments that you can do for your patient. And just another side note, if your patient's blood pressure is above 185 systolic or above 100 diastolic, uh, and the patient is a candidate for TPA, then we need to bring that blood pressure down a little bit so that um, they can actually receive, a, receive, receive TPA because TPA can't be given with a systolic blood pressure greater than 185 or a diastolic greater than 100. So other than that, um, those are the main essentially nursing treatments that I would advise for uh, a nurse taking care of a patient with TPA. And of course, um, and then we'll talk about the other ones here in a second. So we've talked about ischemic stroke, what it is, the types of ischemic stroke, thrombotic and embolic. We've discussed risk factors for ischemic stroke, signs and symptoms to recognize, things to look out for that may mimic a stroke. We've also talked about uh, diagnosis, CT and MRI. And we talked about treatment. We have went over the IV fluids, the TPA given within three and a half to four hours, okay? That's the maximum time. Um, EKG monitor, monitoring their neural status, monitoring their sugar, making sure they have good coax on boards. Now, let's go into the last part, nursing considerations. History. So if you're getting a history on this patient, it's important to ask them when they were last normal or to verify this with a family member as well. And sometimes they'll say, I don't know, I don't remember, things like that. Well, when was the last time you remember walking to the bathroom? Or were you normal when you, sometimes you have to just get creative. Were you normal last night before you went to bed? Well, what time did you, did you usually go to bed? Um, did your husband next to you see you get in bed and everything? Just ask them questions to try to help them bring it back because these patients are going to be scared and frightened and they're not going to be able to think or talk and they may not even be able to talk. So you may need to probe their family member as well, but get creative and try to figure out when was the last time they were seen normal and things because this will help further determine whether or not these patients need are a candidate for TPA. Other things is physical exam. What can you look for on physical exam? Well, check their pulse. Is their pulse irregular? Is it regular? If it's irregular, could they have some kind of cardiac arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation? What does their skin look like? Are, are there bruisings and hematomas everywhere that could indicate um, that the patient may be bleeding? Okay. Um, other things is listen to their carotid arteries. Is there some a brewy there that you can hear? Maybe they have some, uh, some stenosis or a clot here that's causing a decreased perfusion to the brain. Or maybe they threw off a piece of plaque from their arteries and that caused um, an occlusion in the brain. Okay, what are their heart sounds? Is their heart sounds, do you hear a murmur? Uh, things like that that could be causing it. So physical exam is good. And neural status, most of all, make sure to check their neural status 
I had a patient who came up from the emergency room. He was in the emergency room all day. He came up to the ICU and we were told the patient was fine and it just looked like he had a little bit of a, it looked like he had a seizure, but he was doing okay, things like that. He came up to the unit. This man was not talking. His pupils were pinpoint. He wasn't moving and he was at severe risk of aspirating. His mental glaucoma scale was a four. All right. So a GCS of less than eight, a Glasgow coma scale, when you're not awake enough to protect your airway and you're at risk of aspirating or choking, then that's an emergency. So it's important that doctors and the nurse practitioners can't be around all the time. So I'm thankful that the nurses grabbed me and said, hey, I'm really worried. This patient just got up here and I assessed his mental status and he's not doing anything for me. I think that um, you need to come see them. I'm, I'm glad that they did their neuro checks on this stroke patients. As soon as I saw them, I immediately intubated this patient. So I cannot stress that enough. If there's any changes in the mental status that you're seeing, um, anything like that that can essentially warrant a further deterioration of their mental status, then let somebody know so that we can do something about it. So those are... I would say the nursing jewels. Uh, fever is another one. Uh, if the patient has a fever, you want to treat that because that can cause brain injury as well and monitoring their sugars. And just being there for the patient and their family, this is new, it's scary. I can't imagine going through a stroke. So just be there and be empathetic to whatever they need. They may be uh, overactive. I get a lot of families that just freak out and I don't take it personal. And you shouldn't either just because they are scared in this time. So remember that as well. If they are increased for in increasing intracranial pressure, then you don't want to lay the head of the bed flat, right? Because if it's flat, then the pressure can go up. So you want to keep that head of the bed up as well to decrease that uh, intracerebral pressure. So we've talked about Ischemic stroke, the two types of ischemic strokes, thrombotic and embolic. We talked about risk factors, the ones you can modify and the ones you can't modify. We talked about signs and symptoms of ischemic stroke, things that mimic extreme strokes, ischemic strokes as well, how to diagnose ischemic strokes, the treatment, and nursing consideration. Good job, guys. If you like this video, please let me know in the link below. Subscribe to my site. I'll have more videos coming. And whatever you guys want to talk about, I'm excited about teaching. I love to talk about anything related to medicine. So whatever you're going through in nursing school or whatever you have questions about, don't hesitate to just ask me in a link below. Thank you.